Maxwell, thank you for the invitation, uh, Anka. And we organized it like that. Max will start with uh, this presentation, and then uh, Arnulf will supplement it with the archaeological part. And I will talk a little bit about Uruk in this first presentation. And then later at the end, I will say something about the Genesis flood because it is also in this region. And we think that this topic is also quite interesting. So we would start now with Max. Yeah. Thank you, Helmut. Thank you, Anka, for the invitation, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, but let, let me also say two, three words um, before I start. We, we try to merge like two of the major sites and topics that we have worked on in the, um, in the Near East in the recent past. Um, and um, we try to combine it, and there are certainly uh, connections between um, Lower Mesopotamia and the Northern Arabian Peninsula. In particular, if we talk about paleo environments and um, paleo climate, and I try to um, try to uh, clarify and, and demonstrate this connection. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I will start to um, introduce the uh, physical environment of the um region that we talk about and then i will hand over to um arnulf hausleiter who is the who um has been the main excavator of the oasis of tema in northwestern arabia where we also conducted our paleoenvironmental in investigations and uh, he will introduce the fascinating oasis the archaeology and history and then i will um again take over to refer to the uh, paleoenvironmental data that we have generated in the recent past and the interpretation of that. So, um, and um, after that, we will hand over to the um, uh, work that mainly Helmut has conducted in Lower Mesopotamia, and we will um, come up with, with um, certain connections here. So let me check. Yeah. So that's mainly the um, the outline, just these four um, bullet points. And as an add-on, Helmut has a presentation about the Genesis flood and how this is connected to the environmental dynamics of the last millennia. So um, this is just to demonstrate the present climate of the area of interest that we talk about. This is a map of the annual precipitation and you see the sites of Tema and of Uruk. And um, what we can see here is that is extremely arid. We have in Tema, there is annual precipitation of around 50 millimeters. This is really not much. Um, it is more if we look towards um, upper Mesopotamia, this is, is getting much more, but in lower Mesopotamia and also in northern, in particular in the northern Arabian Peninsula, is, is very, very low numbers of rainfall per year. And um, you can see the climate diagrams, and we see that most of the year, um, these are three climate diagrams from um, uh, Mesopotamia, um, Basra, Baghdad, and Mosul. And um, what you can see here is most of the year is, is arid. And um, the major issue is when we look at these maps, the um, high temperatures and high insulation, solar insulation um, results in extremely high evaporation rates. And even though if we had more precipitation, um, the evaporation consu consumes most of the water available through rainfall. Um, this is another map with, with um, indicating the numbers. This is 50, and we are around 50 in the area of Tema, 50 millimeters per year. That's really not much. So going back to Mesopotamia, um, it's not only low rain, uh, rainfall rates, it's also a great variability. So um rainfall is very unreliable there might be years without any rainfall and there are some years with more rainfall and this is also reflected um, in mesopotamia by um, the stream flow of the two major rivers 
even though they are fed by um, rainfalls in Upper Mesopotamia, which are a bit more abundant, we have um, greatly varying um, um, available water in these rivers that you can see here. This is frequency of occurrence, and you, we have years with 10 billions of cubic meters and years with um, 40 um, billions of cubic meters for Euphrates. So um, there's a great variability and it's very unreliable in terms of stream flow. The major control for um, Euphrates and, and Tigris stream flow is the North Atlantic oscillation that drives the westerlies um, and that drive actually the entire uh, Eastern Mediterranean climate. This is the correlation that has been established by Cullen and Diminoco um, about 20 years ago. So the Mediterranean climate is one factor delivering uh, precipitation to this area, um, mostly in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula and, and also to Mesopotamia is, is an important source and also like the Levant depends on uh, rainfall from the westerlies. But there are also other climate systems, in particular the, the monsoons coming from East Africa and also the Indian Ocean monsoon that provide um, rainfall to the Arabian Peninsula. So looking at a site like such as Taima in um, right in the middle of different um, systems delivering rainfall is very difficult to decipher um, which one, like in, in terms of the variability over time, it's very difficult to decipher which module, atmospheric module um, might have been provided um, rainfall um, and how these dynamics have shifted over time uh, for a site like Tama, for example. So certainly Mediterranean winter ra rains play a role, but also um, the East African monsoon has played a role in the past. So um, looking at Mesopotamia and trying to decipher the climate variability for this area is not easy. And the, the main reason is that there are no reliable geological climate archives right within the region that might tell us about um, past climate variability. And um, so there are, if you look at the square, at the triangles here, um, these are the main climate archives that are relevant um, and provide some information on climate variability in Mesopotamia. And they are all quite outside the, main, the, the core region, like Lake Van, for example, here, the cave records in the Levan. This is Tema, it's quite far. Um, yeah, so there's no direct evidence, only um, attempts can be made to correlate with other records. So um, just to refer to what so-called like geological archives um, of past climates, how they look like. Um, there are different types of um, climate archives um, that can be sediments, that it can also be um, carbonate flow stones from caves. So these are the most important ones um, in the area of interest. And this is only to demonstrate you, this is the um, example from the Oasis of Tema, which I will refer to um, later um, in this presentation. And what you can see here is segments of one meter um, sediment cores that have been taken in the sedimentary archive. Um, and this sedimentary archive covers roughly the last 9,000 years. So these numbers refer to singular cores that we took at, at, at the same site to have enough core material for our sedimentary analyses. So, um, and what we also did, um, we took overlapping cores. So this is the first segment roughly one zero to one meters, there was compression, so it's only 70 centimeters. That's the next meter, the next meter, the next meter. And what we can, and then we have overlapping cores where we try to 
fill the gaps in between the core sections. And there are significant layers in the course that help us to correlate the different cores. Um, and that's indicated by the blue lines here to connect all these cores. So this is how the core looks like in detail. And the fascinating thing about the timer archive is that we have a layered record. And in some parts, we even have annually layered um, record. And that's something I will refer to in some of the later slides. Um, one of the, well, basically the climate archive with the highest resolution are speleothems that are available in um, mostly in, uh, in carbonate, uh, carbonate geologic regions, in caves, in uh, particular in Oman, that have also annual, sub annually layered um, records actually um, that can be analyzed uh, in terms of their chemistry and also their isotope chemistry. And they um, give quite precise and, and also the, the dating is, uh, is, uh, is well possible um, through uranium thorium. And uh, so we have very precise uh, reconstructions of climate fluctuations. So um, the next um, part of the presentation is we focus on our study on the Oasis of Tema. And I'll hand over to Arnold Faustleiter, who will introduce us to the history and archaeology of the Oasis of Tema based on long-term archaeological excavation. Thank you very much to, to uh, Anka. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And also to my colleagues, I just returned from Tema two weeks ago. And what I found on my desk, of course, on my virtual desk, was an invitation to join this seminar. And actually, even though uh, we haven't really discussed about it, I, I, I received your slides uh, just uh, half an hour ago. Um, we have been working for so many years together, so I'm, I'm, I'm really much, pretty much confident that uh, our presentations will match. And if not, we can discuss about it. So it's really very, very, very nice uh, of you, Helmut and Max, to to have, a pro have me uh, approached me. And I'm, um, I mean, it's also a challenging type of um, format. Uh, we have apparently three hours to present and to discuss. And I see there's a number of uh, colleagues from uh, different parts of the world. So I'm very much honored to uh, join you today in, in sharing our thoughts. What I'm talking about today is basically the, the history and archaeology of the Oasis of Tema. And of course, I'm not talking about it because it's uh, an oasis uh, which has its first traces of human occupation or, or presence, I would say, in the late Neolithic, and it's occupied under today, which is a challenge and a problem for archaeologists, also for geoarchaeologists and geomorphologists. But uh, as we will see, the 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 um, uh, geoarchive we we are or you are relying on, uh, uh, fortunately, is not um, covered by uh, too much modern occupation. So some facts and figures. Um, it's a uh, up to 9.2 square kilometers large walled uh, groundwater fed oasis. It's located on a branch of the Arabian trade and uh, communication network. As I said, human presence is attested from the late Neolithic onwards um, to Near Eastern archeologists uh, and scholars, some of uh, who I've seen in, among the audience <laughs> is uh, probably known that it was the, the residence of the last Babylonian king, Nabonidus, who claims to have resided there for 10 years of his reign uh, under circumstances which are not fully clear. And also from uh, Arabian historiographers and geographers, uh, Tema is known as a wealthy marketplace in the early Islamic period. I am, um, as, as Max already said, um, the research um, I'm presenting is basically the result of a long lasting uh, project run by the uh, Heritage Commission uh, of the, at the Ministry of Culture of Saudi Arabia and the German Archaeological Institute and a number of um, institutions such as the University of Cologne and also when you were still in Marburg, you already were part of our joint uh, project and numerous other universities who I'm unable to mention now uh, in this context. Um, and the project was and is still um, funded by the German Research Foundation, who gave a substantial grant for um, this um, research project. So um, 
where are we? So uh, some of the facts uh, uh, and figures I already said have already been mentioned by, by Max. So, um, so we are basically uh, uh, here in the northwestern part of the uh, Raymond Peninsula. We have a hyper climate um, where some of the numbers have already been mentioned. Um, and what is important is Tema is located in the flat plain of the Arabian Shield. You can see that here on the left uh, side, it's basically fed by the Sak Aquifer, which we are coming back to in a minute. And um, a salt flat here, uh, the, the purple area, the blue area in north of the oasis is the lowest point in the region. And uh, uh, the height uh, 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 around 800 meters above sea level and is a terminal basin of an endorheic catchment. And the central map here shows um, the uh, research area of a hydro hydrological research group who has been studying in the southern part of Jordan and also in several sites in northern um, Arabia. And uh, sticking to the hydrological uh, information, um, uh, it's important to say that Tema is a groundwater fed oasis. I already mentioned that before, and this is, uh, situation is particularly relevant for the constant water supply through the ages, through the millennia, even though there might have been a slight uh, decrease on the water table um, in the Iron Age. Um, but generally, the water, presence of water was never really a problem. There are other oases in the regions, such as Koraya, uh, which apparently have been abandoned at the end of the Bronze Age or, at the, at the, or a little bit later. But this was not the case. Um, at Tema, even though they have certainly, there are dynamics of uh, economic and social nature, um, uh, which can be detected in the archeological record. So still um, surface catchment is about 660 square kilometers and the much more important subsurface catchment is far larger. The geological situation is characterized by what is known as the Tema Graben, um, which basically is, uh, forms basically the context of the uh, a pressurized uh, artesian groundwater, which is, as I mentioned before, from the Sak Aquifer. It's a three kilometer thick um, aquifer um, reaching up to Jordan. And uh, wadis provide an insufficient runoff and, of course, uh, flash floods. So, um, as Michael McDonald said, I'm sorry. Um, Arabia was by no means all desert, and this is very important if you then um, uh, try to uh, go out to reach out in the surroundings of Tema. And what has been mapped here by uh, Kai Wellbrock is um, an unsystematic survey of waterholes and wells in the region up to um, 120 kilometers away from Tema. Uh, certainly not so much, but still in the Nafud. And how do they look like? So they are either just water holes. Some of them have been um, walled, so really wells, or here you see a concrete uh, uh, framing. And just a meter or two below surface, there's water. So for the, for the uh, flocks uh, uh, and camels around, um, this water is, of course, a drinkable resource. In some other cases, there are really springs and, of course, plants, as well as um, rock art um, or rock carvings depicting uh, important uh, or providing pro important information uh, about um, the fauna, as you can probably see here on the right top. Um, and our colleagues um, from Oxford um, are, the, are currently researching on this, also trying to date the, I'm sorry, um, the, these um, rock carvings in order then to, to uh, get a chronological sequence out of it in terms of uh, which animals are attested at what time. So again, so Tema needs to be understood also by its surroundings. And if we just, um, before going into detail, uh, let me just um, reflect uh, on, on the aspect of an oasis. Uh, of course, uh, late Tony Wilkinson, um, uh, uh, put it in, 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 in words uh, which, which are valid, of course, not only is the desert the quintessential Near Eastern landscape, it's also a landscape of survival. And in his, uh, as I would say, the archaeological uh, or uh, the uh, grammar of landscape archaeology for all of us, uh, he, of course, based on his immense knowledge, um, developed a schematic representation of an oasis landscape. Um, however, um, just to put the question of oasis a little more in a wider context, the number, numerous publications have come out in the recent years. One is called Oasis and Globalization. And um, again, it's very important to stress that 
water alone, um, and I saw that also that we have we are talking about the impact of the environment, not about the depending dependency of, of, of environmental factors in, in this paper today. So a number of other factors have to be taken into account. I just want to uh, look on two quotes here from uh, Marshall and Lavie. The oasis is often perceived as a place in contrast with this environment. Uh, water is a necessary but insufficient condition to explain the creation of an oasis. In fact, the formation and maintenance of oasis are the result of several historical, political, and social factors. And uh, from a different point of view, um, a collective uh, volume published in 2018 and edited by uh, Louis Perdue, uh, Yuna Charbonnier, and uh, Lamia Khalidi, um, um, the author stayed, oasis are isolated by the aridity of their surrounding landscapes and yet linked to the other oasis by migration and trade routes. Their modification to water and agroscapes fosters new ecosystems attracting and favoring species that could not have otherwise survived and adapted and turning these oases into artificial refugia. So this is basically to setting the, for setting the scene and uh, which doesn't make everything, uh, which doesn't automatically make it easy to find an explanation for everything we are studying, but basically it, it shows us how, 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 how our, our oasis can be and uh, should be probably understood. Um, and I want to close this slide with a quote, uh, which is here above uh, by Ahikara, the advisor to the Syrian king, King Senachar bin Asahadon. Uh, who says, uh, don't show the seed to a man from Arabia and don't show the roots of the desert to a man from Sidon because the works are different, which is interesting and also describes a little bit what we are probably discussing today. So um, as Max mentioned already, um, um, the geo archive of the Sapra of this former Paleo Lake north of the oasis is, is of immense importance for uh, everything we discussed today. So uh, it's an paleo lake of approximately 20 kilometers extension serving as a geo archive, and it covers the period between roughly 9,250 to 4,200 KLBP. And I'm focusing now on the paleontological analysis, which allowed for the reconstruction of the beginning of oasis um, cultivation. And um, this has been done in the frame of this multi-proxy analysis, uh, combining a number of institutions and individual scholars um, in particular, the Archaeobotanic Research Group of the German Archaeological Institute and the Free University of Berlin. And uh, let's say as a surprise uh, to outsiders, uh, it didn't start with camels and date palms, but um, oasis uh, cultivation at Tema started with horticulture, um, predominantly characterized by uh, grapevine and figs. Um, as one might know, it's very difficult to identify or to discern um, um, grain pollen from grass. So that's an open issue, so to say, among, in, among pollenologists. And here's one of the diagrams uh, set up by um, Michel Dinius, uh, where you can see the timeline and the attestation of a number of these um, um, pollen. Um, and all this work led uh, to a number of uh, reconstructive scenarios. Um, I don't want to Go here into detail. I just want to point out here in the uh, in the middle what what our colleagues call 4A, the highest cerealia type and shared particles proportions for sporadic grapevine pollen and sporadic fig pollen records, Ficus carica and Ficus vasta type. Um, that's around 7,000 uh, BP, um, leading to the hypothesis that oasis cultivation at that time may have started. And this uh, the more since the natural distribution area of both uh, grapevine and figs lie approximately 500 kilometers north of the Tema oasis. So it's not just some um, seeds in Poland which flew in, but it's, it's a, a clear uh, a record which can be interpreted in this way. Just uh, bottom left, um, you see the Phoenix duck bilifera is basically attested in the macro remains in the second half of the um, uh, second millennium BC. So between 3,500 and 3,000 um, Cal BP. And um, it was always uh, thrilling for uh, archae us archaeologists to work with, with um, paleoenvironmentalists, uh, since it was not only a different type of sources we were dealing with, but also different uh, type of, uh, of, of periods, which, however, are overlapping. And I just show you a, a summary, uh, bottom left, of the um, vegetation history elaborated by Michel Dinius. 
how it covers just the early beginnings of um, the oasis occupation as attested through the archaeological excavations which last from the late neolithic uh, bottom here number 12 and reaches um, until tema one today so um, this is of course very thrilling and i will focus on what i'm uh, now uh, presenting you in the remaining part of my my paper on this uh, overlap and uh, what is uh, the archaeological evidence of this early occupation um, at Tema. And in fact, uh, it's um, not in the center of the oasis here, an aerial photograph of the site in 1956, which is important to, to know because today most of the southern part is covered by uh, modern uh, expanding settlement um, impacting the archaeological visibility. Um, so here are some surface findings with clear uh, uh, affinities to the Levantine lithic traditions. They have uh, all been found on the surface. However, uh, the situation is different in this area here in the northeastern part in the eastern Sebra area, where um, uh, large amounts of drills and uh, fragments of discoids, carnelian beads have been found. Here a representation of uh, by Max Hyped, uh, putting uh, together the evidence. So what has been um, identified here is a, a production area, a large scale, uh, we call it industrial production of um, carnelian beads. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands are scattered over the surface. Some of them you can see they have been collected here and then put in a row. And also carnelian um, uh, um, raw material has been found. Max Hyped in his master thesis developed the Chien Apparatoire for both the flint uh, drills and the carnelian beads. And it's really, I think we have less than 20 complete specimens at Tema, where the uh, large quantity of Canadian are just a uh, fragment in production refuse. We have ha run a first series of um, um, uh, analysis with John Kenoyer. And uh, I just see that on this map here, top right, the uh, Tema is missing anyway. Uh, so we have been basically identifying, trying to identify um, the different sources for carnelian, and Tema seems to have a local source, but there are sources of, of carnelian all over the Near East. And then we have also done the first round of chemical analysis, seeing that some of the um, Tema um, specimens match with evidence from Phylaka. And um, the idea of, uh, or the, the idea that these materials have been traded or uh, produced for trading is reflected, for example, by uh, Negro's article in 2014, where he identifies um, in Northwest Arabia as the potential source of uh, carnelian beads in, uh, for example, the event. In any case, the, the, the absence of these beads, I think I said already, uh, it's less than 20 attested at Tema, is quite striking uh, uh, related to the huge quantity of drills here. That's all dating to around 4000 BCE, basically based on a yet one C14 date. Our colleagues who have been um, uh, doing research farther southwest recently, uh, Melissa Kennedy and Hugh Thomas, they have identified structures where Canadian beads have been attested, funerary structures, and they have a date around, I think, 4200, 4300 BC. So I, I expect that we will, uh, in the future, we'll have a wider range of, of, of dating also from Tema. So all this um, uh, in a way was surprising because it was not in the oasis area. It was not in the center of the oasis, but in this uh, area Northeast, we have then carried out um, uh, geophysical uh, prospecting and uh, a number of structures which have probably need to be interpreted as canals have been identified. If so, there would be a very early irrigation um, until now they haven't been really dated. And the other aspect, which is still um, not really much studied, is the location of agricultural areas. So uh, that is also why we returned this year to particularly this area and the northeastern part of the Sebra in order to identify soil uh, and to, to have a sounding there in order to identify whether uh, the location of these beat makers is somehow related to other activities uh, in the area. And the potential areas for agricultural activities yet are here in the northeast and in the Northwest uh, and in the Iron Age here down to the South, whereas all this area is today covered by modern terracing. So it's extremely difficult to obtain direct evidence unless you um, um, do a, a carry out a deep trench and deep sounding there, which we have done actually, I will show you that later on. And exactly that's what we did this year now. 
Um, so um, the question was, are there any uh, indications for agricultural uh, activities in this area? And here amidst the Sefra near within the wall here, you see SE18, uh, 20 meters trench has been uh, dug in the frame of the ground check project, uh, which is uh, funded by the German foreign ministry and Max Heib and Julia Schönecke have um, led this uh, operation and they uh, identified in fact uh, sediments which may uh, be here's a sand sediment that's the, uh, the last remaining sediments of the lake um, and there's a up to 30 centimeters thick sediment which they interpret as an agricultural um, layer and uh, as you can see on the right side uh, all these hypotheses need of course been uh, need to be uh, verified so we have taken a, a large amount of material for a sample by, by flotation and it's on the way to Berlin to be analyzed. So that happened, let's say, a month ago, and we are really curious to see uh, what will come out of this um, section. Another, um, um, another aspect um, or another site which uh, was uh, discovered by coincidence is in this area where you can see Almadi farm um, where by coincidence, um, uh, by bulldozing activities uh, up to uh, down to three meters, four meters below surface, a complex canal system was discovered, uh, at least two faces um, <clears throat> uh, beneath uh, these terraced um, accumulations of artificial soil for uh, present day uh, agriculture. And uh, what has been found is a multi-phase canal system, as well as again, as you can see here, probably uh, the bottom of the lake uh, uh, sediment here, and immediately on top of that, um, uh, a wall which may either belong to the canals or to a, a building or something like this. I think it belongs to a, a wall, either a retaining wall, or um, or to the canal or both. Um, this is so in so far important as uh, we haven't had really any evidence so far for anything built up on the on the latest um, sediments by the lake or by the swampy lake when it was about to dry out. And this, the more is interesting since the dating of the associated finds, I have to say that because it's not uh, stratified and we have to also here um, wait for C14 dating and uh, I think also OSL, yes. The dating, however, of the material which is there is not surprising is again drill and carnelian, which uh, as we say may have, uh, may provide a kind of 4000 BCE date, but the younger, uh, material is um, red burnished pottery, which is a pottery type uh, well known from the settlement uh, from the um, uh, mid <clears throat> third to or late third to the middle of the second millennium. So probably that's more significant uh, since um, drills and carnelian fragments are tested uh, at many sites at Tame as stray finds. Uh, so probably also here, but this is uh, was entirely unexpected because there is an irrigation system in the southern part of the site, which is has been dated to the Iron Age or earlier difficult date. But this seems to be uh, a different story and uh, Bronze Age uh, irrigation um, system, which is not connected to the one we found here um, or we have interpreted here in the northeast uh, in the geophysical prospection. So also this is a work in progress and it just uh, was uh, carried out. Um, a month ago, um, but it shows that irrigation appears to be um, an important element uh, in this oasis um, for agriculture and agricultural production. So what is still unclear is why, when and how, or for which reasons, then the settlement, the permanent settlement shifted from this area to the center, um, which is here marked by the uh, red frame. Um, that's a 70 uh, hectares uh, large area. And um, the earliest remains, you can see here a number of C14 dates are uh, in the late fourth millennium. Uh, and they are, there's not really a full sequence, but, but what has been dated uh, seems to be clear. So there's some kind of uh, late fourth millennium BC uh, occupation. And then it continues to the, in the early parts of the um, third millennium. And this uh, coincides with the, with some of our colleagues call the urban explosion of these oases in Northwest Arabia, certainly something which can be debated, um, but there's a huge wall system uh, with, with the mud brick walls uh, on a sandstone foundation, still today preserved more than six uh, or altogether eight meters high. Uh, and these 9.2 square kilometers, I think in the Bronze Age, according to current reconstructions, 
um, at least uh, 8.9 or 9 square kilometers were walled in this early Bronze Age uh, phase, which is quite important and interesting because our view on, on Tema, as I said at the very beginning, was uh, always um, somehow, somehow impacted by Nabonidus, the Assyrians, and the Incense Road. So the main, uh, the largest extension of Tema already uh, was almost reached in the early um, Bronze Age. And this uh, context is not only dated, but also connected to with a pottery uh, production, which has been identified by, stratify, by stratif stratigraphic ex uh, excavations in the center of the site. Um, just some final remains, uh, some remarks on the faunal remains. They also indicate that uh, um, um, hunting is, is just a marginal uh, part of, of the um, food supply, whereas the main um, um, faunal remains are from the settlement of this early Bronze Age period are um, sheep, goat, and a smaller quantity of uh, cattle, which has been identified at uh, uh, counting 2000 plus um, NISP. So putting all this into a wider framework, um, 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 I would say that uh, the result, and, and that's why I show this map, and that's my, I think my, my last slide, the results obtained from our research, um, to my understanding, or to my, as I would say, um, uh, calls for a new a view on the Arabian Peninsula with regard to the emergence of complex societies in ancient uh, Western Asia. I probably did not really focus so much on the debate on urban oases, but we can do that. Um, what is quite clear is that a Northwest Arabian oasis participated to economic communication networks from the late fourth, fifth or early fourth millennium onwards. And the size of the urban oasis settlements is by far larger than that of EBA urban settlements in the Levant, where this phenomenon has been studied in recent years. It's still being studied, and there's many um, uh, trajectories of discussion going onwards regarding the impact from Mesopotamia or um, versus uh, local or regional um, developments. However, Northwestern Arabia's Arabian oasis communities may have been organized differently following corporate rather than hierarchical schemes. And I know by saying this, um, there may, may be a discussion uh, coming up, but I will uh, close my presentation with this last slide, um, which probably contextualizes my part of the presentation, which will now follow um, in the rem remaining part of our presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I'm even more happy um, now um, that you joined the presentation because there are a couple of new things, in particular regarding the latest excavation campaign that are extremely impo important and extremely interesting for us um, when we try to reconstruct the lake that has formed a Taima during a time when climate was much more humid than today. And this is um, something that I'm going to refer to in the next slides and in the next part of the presentation. And, um, and um, yeah, so this is actually what I'm going to do is trying to um, provide an environmental framework for the cultural um, history that has been outlined by Anun. So this is actually um, my single slide about Tema, um, the, uh, the oasis itself, and it covers a few things that um, Anul has presented too. Um, let me check if I can, yeah. So, um, what you can see here is the map of the oasis on Tema, and some things should be familiar by now. It's uh, first thing is the main excavation area of the long-term excavation um, that you can see here, which is basically uh, enclosed, encircled by this uh, monumental city wall. What you can also see is the historical oasis. Um, if you can follow my um, the small arrow. Here um, in the south, um, in the southwest, you can see the modern um, settlement. And north of the historic settlement, there is the date palms. And north of the date palms, there's the Sapra, which is basically an endery basin. It's a terminal basin, um, which is fed by wadis, in particular from the west, but also from the east. And the south, there's one major wadi that makes its way through the historic town. Um, 
basically the subka rep represents logically the lowest lying area of the entire catchment. And if the wadis get activated, um, there is standing water in the subka for a couple of days, two weeks, even today. The groundwater today in the subka is approximately 1.5 meters below ground level. What you can see here is um, one coring transect that we carried out from the historical settlement across the entire subka, but we took uh, a lot more cores um, all, all just all through the subka and also um, adjacent areas of the subka. Um, this is just for geographic orientation. This is um, just for Im visual impression. This is a photo taken from the south, um, somewhere here in the main excavation area. And what we can see here is the main excavation mound, um, followed by um, buildings that provide the transition to the historical settlement, the date palms, and just behind the date palms, there's a sabra, and the sabra in the north is framed by a sequence of escarpments, of structural escarpments um, that you can see very well here. And you can also basically see in the digital elevation model. So um, we did, in the beginning, uh, when we started our work at Tema, we were trying to provide age constraints for the outer city wall that uh, Arnold Pass referred to. And um, we, what we actually, our approach was we dated the uh, sand that accumulated towards the oldest section of the city wall. We um, measured, a, we, we calculated a sequence of um, optically stimulated luminescence data. Um, and all these data were based on our assumption, younger than the establishment, the erection of the city wall at least the oldest section. And this is exactly what we came up with. Um, um, a minimum date, which is roughly in the middle of the third millennium um, BC. And this is actually a date that is confirmed by now, even a little bit older, but this is also supported by our data. So I'm um, also referring to the oldest, um, briefly to the oldest um, cultural like, lithic findings, um, which are very, very scarce and um, uh, which are very scarce um, in, in particular of these tools and arrows, but um, they are massive in massive abundances in terms of the carnelian, carnelian bead production uh, waste that can be found all over the oasis. And in particular here in the east of the Sapwa, um, which is also for us a very interesting marker of um, the lake contraction after the humid phase. Okay, um, in, as a geomorphologist, the most peculiar findings after we surveyed the, um, the surroundings of the Sapra and the entire oasis had been distinct bioclastic deposits stratified that we found in several uh, at several sites at the margin of the subcars of the of the of the subca and um, this is an example from the southern part here in the southwest near a site called Castle Hamra and um, what we can see here is a stratified deposit which is almost entirely consisting of fossil uh, of fossils. Um, that is, in this case, gastropod shells, um, basically only two species, Melanoides and um, Hydrobia, um, as well as barnacles, which was surprising at first, plus um, uh, a lot of microfossils such as foraminifera and ostracots. The fact that this Bioclastic deposit has accumulated in situ right where it is, where we find it here, is that at the base of these deposits where we find the bedrock, the barnacle colonies, which are sessile crustaceans, which attach to the rock, we find them in living position at the base of these deposits. 
And we also find them in several other sites um, very close to these deposits um, attached to the, the, the local sandstone here. And um, all of these, apart from the gastropods, but the barnacles and also the ostracods and the foraminifera, they require permanent, uh, they require a saline, like a, a, a saline lake, um, a permanent lake that um, prevails um, over an entire year. And um, so we have a couple of situations where we even find these stratified bioclastic deposits overlain by parts of the city wall system, uh, which gives also a very interesting time constraint. So we can say that these deposits are certainly older than the city wall. This is a view from the northern escarpment towards the Sapa, and um, this is actually from the west towards the east. Um, so and these are the this is the northern limit by the escarpment and the flat sapra, and you can see in the background also the uh, date palms of the oasis. So um, next I'm going to show the deposit that we found in the northeast, which is the one that we studied in most detail. But first there's uh, another view on the sapra, and this is the flat part of the sapra, um, the center that is covered by uh, gypsum and salts, salt polygons, as you can see here. So this is the main, um, the main shoreline deposit that um, of the Paleo Lake as we interpreted it. Um, and we find this bioclastic deposit here in a thickness of almost three meters. Here you can see a detail with um, where it almost entirely consists of shells, shell deposits. A bit, a bit of quartz sand, but it's, it's mostly entirely consisting of shells. Also in, at this side, we found the barnacle colony in like singular remains of barnacles in living position as a testimony that this deposit has accumulated here as proof of a former um, lake body. In some parts, we even find flow structures um, like, um, uh, flow structures, delta type flow, structure, flow structures um, of surface water debouching into this former lake. Um, our first study of um, fossils uh, fo focused on microfossils. We found four different um, foram species, as you can see here. And um, all of them need permanent water, um, but can also deal with highly fluctuating sal salinities. We found one uh, ostracod species that is also a cosmopolitan species and um, um, a very like a competitive species in very extreme uh, changing environments. These are all our first uh, radiocarbon dates from this deposit, um, roughly between 10,000 to 9,000 before present, calibrated years before present. Later, it turned out that they suffer from hot water effects and are significantly too old, probably 1,000 to 1,500 years too old. But all of the dates that we obtained from the carbonates, um, are, they are always, um, um, uh, they always um, in, a, in, in, a, um, in a meaningful stratigraphic sequence. So we don't have age inversions. Um, in, in, in no case, we had any age inversions. So um, there are preliminary OSL ages also from this part. They also they appear quite old. Um, these, uh, as I say, they're preliminary. We still have to discuss them. So this is, um, again, something that also Arnold has referred to. Um, this is actually the lake as we can um, reconstructed based on a digital in elevation model uh, from the um, colleagues of um, University of Applied Science in Lübeck and uh, in combination with our findings um, of shoreline deposits. This is the actual um, catchment of the entire Sapra and we see that most bodies, they enter they're from the south and the east here and the west here. So um, yeah, then we try to correlate our findings from 
uh, based on the shoreline deposits and try to find the correlating sediments inside the SAPCA. And therefore, over the years we carried out, um, we took a lot of sediment cores. We, I also refer to this north-south transect. I'm going to show this later, but first I'm going to refer to the master core that we actually used um, to test um, a, a broad spectrum of proxies that gives us information about the, um, the chemistry, the ecology of the lake, and um, um, like and 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 also about um, climatic fluctuations. This is actually also the core where um, most of the uh, pollen samples were taken that Arnold has referred to earlier. So, um, at one site where groundwater was uh, very low, we found the um, uh, stratigraphy, the main, the, the, the most important part of the stratigraphy and the most, um, um, yeah, the most uh, relevant part of the strat stratigraphy above groundwater, we could duck down, and this is actually how it looks like. And uh, based on uh, radiocarbon data and um, uh, tephra chronology, because we also found a tephra in here that we could correlate, um, we were able to um, um, identify these. Um, layers as bars representing valve couplets that represent one year. So this is actually annual valves, um, an annual resolution for a certain part of the sediment core. Um, the project um, that um, was established to study this core was called CLEAR. It was a collaboration with colleagues from um, several different institutions and funded by German Research Foundation. This is um, just one impression from the center of the subcom with um, TP structures with salt polygons and massive salt and gypsum um, crust on the surface. But um, underneath the, the sediments were uh, very, very different. This is how the core looks like um, as a composite. I've shown you the sections, the, the, the different sections at the beginning of the presentation. And this is actually the composite. This is a drawing. And this is the age model of uh, our master core that is based on C14 of um, concentrated pollen that has been extracted from the sediment. Um, and um, concentrated to uh, until it was enough carbon to date. There are a couple of data that has been rejected, but um, those that have been confirmed have been in, uh, are in combination with um, with a tephra here and provide a quite um, stable and uh, reliable age model here. Um, going from roughly 9,000 before present to um, 4,200 before present, um, which is actually the period of accumulation here. And um, the uppermost 80 centimeters to one meter um, mostly represent the subpa stage where um, there's um, accumulation and deflation um, fluctuating. <clears throat> it's, um, I'm gonna show you some data and try to uh, exemplify what we think they reflect. So what you can see here, again, the sediment core of about six meter 50, the drawing, and this is just um, showing what type of sedimentation, what type of facies um, prevails in a very high resolution. And this is based on micro XIF scanning as with, with a resolution of probably, I, I think, two, uh, roughly two millimeters. So. Um, what you can see here is a total organic carbon, which is a very, in, in, in this context, a very important indicator of um, bioproductivity uh, in this case. And we have a certain um, section of the core where this um, proxy total organic carbon is quite high. And this is exactly the section of the core where we find this annual lamination that I have shown, shown earlier. This annual lamination is interpreted as um, 
a strong seasonal contrast between a humid phase and, a, and an arid phase. The humid uh, part of the Varf couplet is here in this thin section. I give you the scale. These are two millimeters. So the dark part is mostly siliciclastic sediment, mostly silt-sized sediment. But if, if we take a closer look, we see fine fining up sequences in almost all of these small silt um, couplets in the thin sections. And we interpret this as Wadi steep belching, uh, like delivering siliciclastic sediment into the lake where the sediment slowly settles based on their size. Um, so singular um, pulses of, um, um, of sedimentation create these fining up sequences that we can find here. This is one season and the other season is mostly evaporation, contraction of the lake, um, higher con concentration of solubles in the lake water. And at some point, if it gets too concentrated, um, it settles, um, it precipitates and settles. And that's in this case, aragonite, um, uh, uh, calcium carbonate that accumulates at the bottom in combination in some parts with diatoms, um, sil silica algae. So um, this is also reflected by the geochemistry of the core. Um, we've, we mainly can differentiate between siliciclastic parts of the core, gypsum, which is mostly present um, in the upper part of the core, aragonite, which is, um, as I said, part of the um, barf, only part of the barf uh, part of the core. And um, this is actually, and then there's, there's a mixed, uh, there's kind of a mixed group, which is not precisely interpretable. So um, we actually can, in the next slide, differentiate mostly four different facies. Um, which is two, three, four, five. Uh, one is basically the slow onset of uh, water accumulation, um, but still at a wet wetland stage. Then two is the onset of the lake with a carbonatic clastic lamination. But we also see first ostracots here. That means we have uh, the transition from a wetland to a a permanent, a persistent lake from year to year. Um, then we have the stages three to four, which uh, represent the main lake, oh, sorry, the main lake stages, um, as you can see here. Um, and they are dominated by the aragonite barf precipitation in, com in combination with the clastic barfs. And um, after this main lake stage in three and four, there's a drastic <clears throat> drop in water level and a transition again to wetlands. And it becomes significantly drier. And that is mainly uh, reflected by gypsum precipitation here in orange. So here are, um, here are again, uh, thin sections that reflect the four different sediment types. Um, the main lake I have already shown in the previous slide, you have this barf, uh, aragonite bars in in uh, in fluctuating with um, with siliciclastic silicy material, and in the second stage, um, these um, merge into diatom aragonite bars. That means we have a very high productivity and algal blooms. So this is also reflected by our proxies, the isotope proxies that we applied here, um, such as. Um, oxygen isotopes and, and carbon isotopes, and also um, delta D of uh, leaf waxes. The latter are mostly an indicator of rainfall, and uh, we see the highest values in the stages three and four, but we also see them strongly fluctuating, and we believe that the strong fluctuations also somehow reflect um, uh, fluctuations that um, we assume to have to have, have happened from season to season. Um, the delta the delta um, three uh, the the delta um, the um, carbon isotopes 
actually reflect mo mo mostly productivity and they are indeed highest in the lake phase and, and in, in particular at stage four where we find also a lot of diatoms in the thin sections. The uh, oxygen isotopes as mostly um, signal of evaporation have the lowest evaporation signal also in exactly these two stages with some fluctuations um, in stage three, but a quite stable low values in uh, stage four, which we assume has been the wettest period in Tema. But if we look at our age model, this proper lake stage was only roughly 600 years from 8,600 to 8,000, or from 8,550 to 7,950 before present, calibrated years before present, which is surprisingly short. And most of the time, this lake was not really a lake, probably more of a wetland character with standing water, temporary standing water, but mostly swampy, marshy conditions. This is again reflecting like the um, showing the uh, oxygen and carbon isotopes of the four different stages, three and four, the main lake stages um, in, uh, in combination with a suggestion of interpretation by Ling and Marshall. And we see the lower they are in this diagram, they, they go towards, they indicate more humidity. And in this part, they indicate higher biomass and higher bioproduction, um, which is also reflected here by the stages three and four. While if we go up in particular with higher oxygen isotopes, they point towards more aridity. Um, and this is in particular stage five, which is an abrupt change from four, very quite relatively humid to relatively arid um, just within a few years or decades. This is just uh, to demonstrate the um, distribution, the uh, frequency distribution of the different um, varves and, and, um, and um, facies of the core, um, showing the diatom sublayer, which is dominating um, the stage four, and the gypsum, which is indicating the aridity abrupt um, onset of gypsum. Um, at around 7,950 before present at stage five. This is to show that it, this is not just a singular finding uh, the varved sections. We find varved sections in all of our cores. So this layer has definitely filled the entire lake basin at some point. Um, and this is, the, this is the, the south to north transect across the subca. And in blue, you can see here, um, we found it in, in each core, we found this stratified, this VART section. Quite high up into the historical settlement that, that of course came later. So um, what do we do with this, um, with these findings? So we, we find, we, we can actually, we have proof of a permanent lake, but also this permanent lake has only a very, very short duration. And if we compare it with uh, climate records um, of the wider region, the Southern Arabian Peninsula and also the Levant, um, there are some similarities, but also significant differences. So um, there is a phase that is called the early Holocene humid period that goes roughly from 10,000 to 6,000 before present, uh, reflected in, 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 in several climate archives of the wider region, for example, from Kunf Cave, they, uh, they actually um, put it from roughly 9,000 or 9,500 to 6,000 before present. Um, it's also reflected by marine sediments from Northern Red Sea. Uh, from East Africa, lake stands um, have been higher in this, uh, in this period. It's also re reflected in, from the Southern Levant, and the, the, the um, Speleothem records. But our record is very short. And the in interesting thing is that we have the peak 
exactly during a short phase where the, the Holocene unit period has a dry anomaly, which is the 8.2 um, the 8.2 dry, um, dry event that has been detected in a range of different climate records. Um, there's, a, there's a dent here, there's a small trough here, and also here. So um, yeah, how to interpret that? How to explain that? First of all, we have to identify the factor, um, the atmospheric factor that delivered more rainfall to the Timer area at this stage. And um, the most likely reason is an eastward and northward expansion of the East African monsoon. I had, I had the, arrow, the arrow put in, in the other map that I showed previously, I had the arrow put somewhere here, but there's ample evidence based on numerical, in the numerical modeling that the East African monsoon penetrated much further onto the Arabian Peninsula and also much further north. This is a um, climate model simulating the last interglacial, which is quite comparable to the present interglacial, the present Holocene. And this is a map that has been published for um, the Holocene, I think 8,000 years before present, also showing that the East African monsoon penetrates quite far onto the Arabian Peninsula um, at the um, early Holocene humid period. So um, it's quite certain that Taima um, received some moderate, because we're only at the fringes of this additional um, rainfall area, received some additional um, rainfall through the East African monsoon, but probably this was not the only source because um, this source ceased at some point and many of the other archives um, received lower amounts during the 8.2 um, 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 arid event. So um, we were actually discussing a factor that is very local and this might be tropical plumes, which are um, elongated cloud bands which um, travel, migrate in mid-upper atmosphere, and they extend usually from tropical um, locations into the subtropics. They are quite stable. There are a couple of these systems globally distributed. Most of them are in the Pacific, but there's one quite stable system um, taking up moisture offshore west of, of West Africa and delivering these cloud bands on, into the Near East. And this is, uh, this is um, an, a process that is still active um, in autumn and spring, uh, transports moisture to the Middle East and results in moderate to heavy rainfall for one to two to uh, four days. So um, this system is also still active for Tema. So that might be an explanation that we have um, regional differences at a, quite a small scale um, during the early Holocene uh, humid period. Um, another argument for the East African monsoon delivering water to uh, Tema and also feeding the groundwater layer is um, our oxygen isotope uh, measurements of surface water in Tema. We took water from the historical well that should actually reflect, as you can see here, that should actually reflect the uh, aquifer because um, um, it has not, not exposed too much to evaporation. Um, and in this biplot, you see the oxygen isotopes of the water and um, the delta D of the water. And um, we uh, did this for the paleo lake water, the paleo lake sediments. We did this for the for the wetland stage of the sediment core, um, and um, came up with a very heavy um, um, oxygen isotope values, which reflect very pronounced evaporation, which is not surprising here, uh, but much much heavier and much lower than anything that comes from the Mediterranean um, um, 
Mediterranean waters. It's the meteoric water line is most similar, and also the the measurement from the Taima well reflecting the groundwater is most similar to um, the Khartoum Sudan summer precipitation. That of course is almost exclusively fed by the East African summer monsoon. So we see some similarity here, but of course it's a it's a the signal reflects a mixture of factors. So um, it might be an indication, but um, it's debatable. So this is um, a short summary slide, trying to combine, that's the first attempt to combine the, um, the um, paleoclimate interpretation with um, some cultural evolution around the Taima oasis. And um, it becomes very clear that um, this, well, if we if we look at the of the the um, peak phase of the permanent lake, there's only little overlap with the um, with the archaeology that we find uh, that has been found and um, interpreted so far. There is some it, it it only overlaps with some of the singular lithic tool findings, um, but it does not overlap. For example, with the Carnelian bead production, that actually established uh, in the eastern part of the lake um, already when it already had uh, contracted, transformed to wetland, and also at a time where aridization um, in this part of the, of the Arabian Peninsula had already been quite, um, quite uh, pronounced. The interesting thing is that um, the establishment of the oasis, the, the onset of the early Bronze Age, somehow is slightly after another um, aridization pulse that we can reflect from the um, oxygen isotope data. But um, if there's some correlation in this regard, it still has to be discussed. We have not discussed this yet. Um, it's just an observation so far. Okay, that's the story for Tema so far. And um, I will hand over to Helmut um, to present the results from Uruk. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Max. We can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, I was invited to do research here by Margarete van Es, who is now the head of the Orient Abteilung from the German Archaeological Institute. We had uh, one season and then the war broke out, so <laughs> we could not yet go back for a longer period. So you see here the region of uh, Uruk, and it is, uh, you see the wall also around it, the red wall, and it is about 11 kilometers long. So it was a major and important city in lower Mesopotamia. More familiar is Ur, the city of Abraham, but Uruk is north of it for your, so you see it in the upper right, you see a little bit where it is. And it is an important uh, site nowadays called Varka because um, it is a 16 meter high tell, so a settlement mount. The earliest finds date to the end of the fifth millennium BC. It was founded probably as a twin city at a river. This still has to be proven, but there are indications for that. And most important, it's the birthplace of writing. So the cuneiform lettering that comes from here, 3200 BC. It is also not unimportant that the brewing of beer was invented here. <laughs> Maybe that goes with the writing, I don't know. But this was also invented. This is also very important. And it is the city of the legendary King Gilgamesh, the Gilgamesh epic, you know, and I will come to it later when I talk about Noah's flood story. Next, Max. Yeah, I try. Okay, yeah. weird. Okay, yeah, no, no okay. <laughs> um, so this is in the central part, in front of this what is called Steingebäude. There we did a very deep drill in two thousand two, and we see the typical stratigraphy here. The lowermost part shows um, early Holocene dune formation. This was always the case in all the drills. We stopped there because then also the friction is too much. Sometimes it's after 10, 15 meters, but then comes the dunes. I will say, tell you where they come from. And then 
come alluviation, obviously from the rivers, Euphrates and Tigris and others extended there. They, they uh, put their sediments there, early sediments without settlement indications. And we have in this case in Uruk one and in another drill also, we find traces of freshwater marshes. And we think this is here because of the sea level rise of the Persian Arabian Gulf. We don't have marine indication here. So we think the, um, the sea reached close by, but not at least not at this coring site. But the groundwater table goes high and the sea level goes high, higher than today. We will see it in a minute. And obviously here we have a marsh which corresponds to the close by sea level, which is near. And then in this case, we have uh, all over the settlement, the stratigraphy of the settlement, 5,000 years of urban history. This was also the nice uh, title of the catalog and an exhibition, 5,000 years mega city in Uruk. As I said, we want to have a look at the sea level. Uh, and of course, we cannot refer to Uruk here because uh, we don't have marine sediments, but close by in Ur and in other parts of the sea. And uh, you can see to the right hand side, you see a reconstruction of the sea level curve by Pulse et al, which have the peak around 7000 BP. And you have the modeling of Lumbeck. Lumbeck is a modeler, as you may know, and he has the peak a little bit shifted at uh, 6,000. Interesting is that the peak is higher than today's level. This is different from the Mediterranean, for instance, or the North Sea. Obviously here, we have a higher sea level. Also in other parts of the world, we have sometimes a higher sea level in the Holocene, in Thailand, for instance, and in other parts. Okay, this has to do with a geoid model, of course. And in the left part, you see the transgression, which were reconstructed by Jennifer Pornell, who made an excellent PhD thesis. And uh, she reconstructed uh, the transgression uh, uh, 5,300 BCE and 4,000, 3,300 BC. So you see there, it is reaching Ur and close to Uruk and uh, does not really reach Uruk. The next slide then shows us that we drilled in Qatar and we wanted to reconstruct the sea level curve also there. And from that, you can uh, easily see that we have the sea level a little bit higher than today, let's say three meters up to four meters higher than today, even more shifted to the, to the right, so to speak, to the younger part, 5,500. And we also found the last interglacial sea level. This is often an indicator and uh, you see this in the uppermost uh, points there. Maybe, Max, you can show it at the Mies 5.5, we call it. Yeah. And there we find it at eight meters. So we know from uh, other parts of the world that normally in a glacial eustatic uh, stable condition, these are the sea level at that time is about 1,000, it's about two to four meters higher, and uh, also shown here. But here we have it even a little bit higher also in the. Um, yeah, in the Holocene. So what I'm saying is, if we go in the last interglacial and we find the sea level much higher than two to four meters, normally it is a little uplift, or it shows that at that time also the eustatic sea level was higher than today, as it is also in the Holocene. And more compared to the Holocene, Dosaria in Saudi Arabia, this is an interesting um, um, graph by Parker et al. You see the uh, occupation of Dosaria, and of course the levels where the people were settling is higher than the sea level, but then later the sea level goes a little bit higher. And he did also um, explanation of the highest of the tides. Yeah, he includes also the tides. Maybe you can show this, uh, Max. He has the mean high water level also. Yeah, this is the upper. And in the lower part, he has the mean low water. And so in between, of course, is the tides. And this is also difficult when reconstructing a sea level. In which position are you? You may find a sea level indicator, which is not easy, but you may find it like a paradic peat or something like that. And then what does it really reflect in a tidal regime? In the Mediterranean, it's easy because there is hardly any tides. But here in the Gulf of Arabian Gulf, you may have some tides 
and which may go up to two meters. So then it's not so easy to reconstruct. But what you can see is that, of course, during the settlement time, uh, the settlement is a little bit higher. And you see, yes, and you see the peak of it all in the park or reconstruction about yeah, 5,500 and another little peak about 4,000, which may, um, yeah, we, we may agree with it in our, in our sea level indicators, which we have from Qatar. So we come back now to Uruk and you see an ensemble of all the drills there. And again, in the deepest part, in this case, it is in uh, light uh, green. The, yeah, the, to the right, in light green, this is always the dunes. So we think they, they are the dunes uh, of the, the Pleistocene and in the early Holocene, we had dunes here. And then later we have the sedimentation of the rivers. The, the lowest is the dunes, the lowest stratum. It is homogeneous sand, very homogeneous. It is sterile, you don't find any fossils in it, and it is a depth at a depth of uh, plus 80 up to minus, uh, minus uh, three meters, and then also below because then our drillings ended. And on top then comes the alluvium, yes, of the rivers, and then the layers of the humans, the human occupation, okay? This is outlined again here, and uh, I put the arrow, the green arrow to the marsh. So about in this position is the highest sea level. As I said, in Uruk, no marine sediments, but the sea level is high, close by. And this is why we have a marsh environment here at about plus two meters, as you can see. And this fits also with the higher sea level. It's higher than the present uh, level. Yes. And what was interesting, and this is also why I went there on the invitation of the DAE, uh, because one had found in geophysics that there are some kind of, which was interpreted as canals. The next slide will show us that, uh, yeah, it was uh, Becker, Helmut Becker and uh, Jörg Fassbinder with their geomagnetics. Uh, they found out this nice picture, which you can see here. And uh, yeah, it is relatively easy to interpret what you see as ways here, so to speak, these must have been canals. And you see also very nicely the areas in between and uh, below you see a temple and so on. So in this position or in this situation, geomagnetics works excellently. So that's really, really nice. And you see on a cylinder seal, yes, at that time, people had boats from Reed. And on this boat, which is shown, shown here with uh, someone who is, uh, so managing the boat, you see even transported their goods and uh, all uh, kind of other stuff. So in the cylinder seal is shown that indeed the water was of course very important, but uh, canalized water. Um, so it, it was obviously uh, that they took a branch of the Euphrates probably and they diverted it into the city. Uh, yeah, the, that they managed water even uh, today, you can see here in this, uh, in this uh, image. And it was a living culture until Saddam Hussein drowned, uh, not drowned, it dried it out because uh, there was the opposition for him. So uh, he, he fought them, so to speak, by cutting off the water. But this was still at the beginning of the second of the, of the 20th century. You could make a, an, a picture like that even in the middle of the last century. So for us, it was now important with drilling to prove or disprove, are these really canals? So we drilled, of course, in the structures which had found by the geophysicists, and we drilled outside to have the comparison. And here is a drill inside some of the canals, Uruk 2. And you can see, yes, we have uh, uh, gastropods, Mel Melanopis uh, premorsum, which is a gastropod which is living in running fresh water. So that's a good argument. Then we have a erosional disconformity at the, at the bottom of this canal. And then we have also freshwater uh, bivalves in the upper part, as you can see, the bivalves from the Euphrates River even. Yeah, and when I compare from the inflow of the water, the canal bottom and the outflow, yeah, where it comes into the city is a little bit higher than the outflow, which should, of course, also be 
uh, the case, there has to be a little gradient. So all of that, yes, and we find rolled pieces of ceramics at the bottom, not big ones, but so you see, they are transported by the river. This is also a good indication. And we com could compare with the, with the uh, drilling next to it, and it is different. And when you see the ensemble, yes, indeed, this was a city which was uh, like Amsterdam in the sand, so to speak, with grachten, or, yeah, with canals in the city, and uh, the waters diverted, and also outside in the fields. So out of this red rim, which is the um, city wall, you see the fields, and in the fields you see a lot of canals. And indeed, when we look at it, the next slide shows us the canals. The upper left shows us what is called inverted channels or inverted canals because the canal of course is cut and then the water is flowing in it and later the water gets uh, sediment and then it's evaporation. And finally, the sediment in the canal is stronger than the area around because the area around is the arable land and the arable land was their horticulture. So they were, uh, yeah, they were cultivating the fields and later the wind has easily attacked the fields and blowing off the wind and in the back of the left, you see the, the dunes in the back. Yeah, in the, in the left image, you see the dunes. And in front, you see these inverted channels, which are now higher, higher than the surrounding. Yeah. And in the upper right, you see from palm trees, these are incrustations from the roots of palm trees. And also what the man in the lower, the man in the blue in the lower part, he's analyzing these, uh, the roots there. And in the fields also, we find these uh, unio tigridis also freshwater bivalve. So we see that the, they had a very highly sophisticated yeah, uh, water management system. And indeed, the high civilization cultures of that time are hydraulic cultures. Think of the Harappa culture in the Indus, think of, think of the Nile culture, and think of Mesopotamia, of course, because they had to develop a geometry and they had to measure the fields again. Yeah, and they were highly sophisticated in diverting and canalizing the waters. So that's a very good example for that in Uruk. Next is yours again. Max, the synopsis. Yeah, um, thank you, Helmut. Yeah, and uh, I can I can connect. Uh, I can I can connect immediately here because the sophisticated water management systems. They were, they were in particular important because of a kind of climate deterioration at that point, because we were already outside the early Holocene humid period. It was already becoming more arid and therefore water management was essential and uh, water was there provided by the, the large rivers. It just had to be managed to make use of it and uh, to, um, be successful in uh, cultivation, um, the area. So this is it, it's a bit messy slide, but um, it it was it's supposed to correlate different climate records of the wider region. And um, you might remember that I said we don't have um, we don't have uh, climate high resolution climate records right from the core area of Mesopotamia, they're not existent. So we have to look at um, records from outside the area. And there are, there are actually a few that um, can be shown here. That is Lake Van, which, which is very relevant for upper Mesopotamia. And um, we find a very broad, relatively humid period reflected here until roughly 4,000 before present. And, it, and it's getting more arid. But um, we also have a strong inf influence from the Mediterranean climate, and that is reflected, for example, by the Sorek cave record. And in the crucial time period of the emergence of the, um, the large city states, which is here um, in, in, in dark green, it's already getting a little bit, it's already getting more arid. And we are already outside the, the the basic window of um, the early Holocene humid period. Um, I also have um, shown the timer record, which is further, you've seen it on the map, is further southwest 
and our very short time window of the major lake formation is is much much earlier so um the um formation of the uh, basically the progress of urban organization is already connected to um, um, a climate state of of further progressing aridity. Um, the colors here are supposed to. I don't have the. I think on the next slide there is a legend to that. Um, this is just a cutout of this five thousand to two thousand with a bit more detail and a higher resolution record of the Soric cave record. Um, there's urban growth and a fully urban um, um, era. And um, this is also supposed uh, to show that probably um, so-called RCCs, rapid climate change events, had um, an impact on um, um, on the um, urban societies, and uh, this might be demonstrated by the event around 2200 BCE, the 4.2 K event um, that falls into a um, area and an, an, a period of local decline. That um, in, in in this case for um, uh, Upper Mesopotamia. So um, this, this um, high level of organization um, and management, also technical management, is to some point um, associated is to environmental change, environmental dynamics. Um, and that, uh, that one, in, on one side for Lower Mes Mesopotamia refers to the rising sea level and the um, prograding marshes into the um to the other hand also probably to the ongoing aridization um that um made some sort of water management management more and more mandatory um this is also referred to in a new book is um, unfortunately it's in german so probably um not entire not, not particularly of interest for most um, of the the audience but is uh, also summarizing the um uh, this topic climate change and the um fate of um the cultures um, and also give some indication of climate like uh, trying to connect climate changes and also rapid climate change events with cultural uh, history but just to sum it up and try to make some references um in between the uh the um, research on climate dynamics in the wider region and um, certain trends in cultural history of Lower Mesopotamia. Um, we can state that um, at the early and Neolithic stage, um, the seminomadic subsistence lifestyle happened under a more stable, more humid climate, um, which is actually something that we also can say about Northern Arabia, because um, also around Tema, um, the, the, the major lake phase also falls into the um, um, period of Neolithic semi-nomadic subsistence lifestyles. The gradual aridization during Bay time um, overlaps with uh, the clustering of settlements, social reorganization, um, a, a, a much stronger economic differentiation in society um, and then is met by sea level rise, transgressive wetland um, extension, also during Ubay time. But wetlands also provided a opportunity in particular in terms of transport and also source of food. And that was in particular important um, to somehow cope with rainfall decrease. Um, further population aridity and aridity, these are both trends that were ongoing uh, during the Uruk time and made actually further uh, investment uh, and innovation in um, agriculture technology also mandatory as the coping strategy um, for the arid climate. There's some impact during the 5.2 KARCC, the, um, the arid event, 
on irrigation culture, um, some contraction in urban centers um, can be inferred from the archaeological record um, broad as, as, as a broader um, signal. And then um, the 4.2 RCC that I was referring to earlier, again, coincides with reduced crop yields, some political instability, um, some salinization of fields that can be observed, and also migration um, in the area. So there is some, there certainly is um, interdependence of uh, climate and broader cultural uh, trend, trends in cultural history is um, often not entirely clear because there are a lot of factors playing a role, but um, I think um, there are some um, quite clear correlations that, um, that show that climate has um, a significant impact. Yeah, I want to thank really uh, Ricardo Eichmann who invited us for the timer. Uh, excavation expedition, we would not have done it without him. And of course, the support also of Arnulf, but he is one of the presenters, so that's okay. And Margarete von S, without her, I couldn't have uh, done the work in Uruk. So I really want to give a big thank you to the German Archaeological Institute.